Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Zach Kushner is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out his first appearance in episode 144 of Boundless Body Radio. Zach Kushner is a former football player for the USC Trojans. After his playing days were over, he used a low-carbohydrate, ketogenic diet to lose almost 100 pounds and has never looked back. He now uses his knowledge to help others achieve what he has achieved, an increase in strength and energy and incredible body composition results. After transitioning from an athlete to the corporate world, he faced a dilemma about how to help more people. Zach realized that priorities and responsibilities can make it difficult for people to find time in their schedules to train for a desired physique. So since our last chat, he has expanded his coaching services to help more people all over the world. In order to accomplish the goal, he has developed simple, time-efficient, and, effic- and effective routines consisting mainly of three sessions per week. Paired with a simple and easy-to-follow way of eating, anyone can get in the best shape of their life, just like he and several others has done. In his day job, Zach works as a financial advisor. Zach Kushner, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Balanced Body Radio. Hey, I'm, I'm happy to be back. Thank you for welcoming me on, Casey. Uh, it's been too long, but I'm, I'm glad we're able to make it work. It's been too long, man. It, uh, we talked to you last. It was about two and a half years ago um, in 2021. Um, had a great chat. It was really fun to listen to that again. You had just had your, your kiddo a few months before that, which is great. Before we signed off on that episode, though, as, as we were kind of ending things up, you said that USC was going to beat Utah in that year, 2021. You proclaimed it to the world. Millions of listeners of our show went out. They placed bets. This guy played for the team. He's probably got inside information. I've got news for you, pal. Not only did you not beat Utah in 2021, but you didn't beat them twice in 2022, and Utah won in 2023 as well. Oh, for four. I will give a massive congratulations to the Utah football <laughs> team. Uh, it, it hurt to, to watch us lose that many times, but hey, you know the boys over at Utah, they really put it all out on the field, and I got to respect that. And, um, yeah, I'm not afraid to be wrong. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll stick to what I said. Uh, and it was wrong. And, um, you know, I say we're going to go ahead and beat you guys the next four times because uh, you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. So uh, I'll, I'll stand strong on my conviction. There you go. I love that. You said in the episode, too, that if you if you were wrong about that, I could make fun of you as much as I wanted, which I'm not going to do. I've got a personal policy <laughs> of not, not making fun of former Division One defensive tackles who are much bigger than me. So we'll just leave it at that for now. Um, and it's kind of interesting, too. We've developed a bit of a rivalry that's been really fun between the two teams. But now USC is going to the Big Ten and Utah is going to the Big 12. And it's not very likely that we might ever like play each other again unless it's like a bowl game or something. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's sad to see the, the conference split up the way that it is. Uh, but the, the college football landscape is evolving. So um, as, as much as I hate seeing tradition broken, I understand how it may be for the greater good of the college football landscape. As far as playing Utah again, you know, I hope we can schedule some home and away series because after they joined the Pac-12, um, we did, you know, develop a bit of a rivalry there because you guys put a really good team out on the field, um, obviously. And, um, you know, it'd be it'd be unfortunate if we don't, you know, play you guys a handful of times in the upcoming season. So I I hope it plays out uh, well and uh, we get you guys on the calendar. Yeah, I hope so, too. Um, We had some great games and they're really, really fun to watch. Um, I asked you this before and I'm just kind of curious, as as you said, like the landscape is changing so much. A few years ago when we were on, I asked you the question about the college players getting paid. Honest question. I'm just curious about what you think. Like you at the time had said, like I, these kids are, are working so hard and people are making so much money on them that at least they're getting some scratch. And now that they actually are, what do you think about it? I mean, if we go back to our last conversation, I think what I said was that, you know, a lot of money is entering the game. And um, the people earning it are the players, but I didn't want to see the magic of college football ruined. But at the same time, uh, the people who were financially benefiting uh, weren't the ones who were, you know, producing that revenue. So it does seem it's a bit more fair that it does go to the players. Uh, now, a lot of interesting things have happened with the, the NIL. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that uh, these, these players are, are being financially set for life if they, they manage their, their wealth correctly, or at least some of them and, you know, other guys making money. Um, but going, you know, back to what I had said, I do think it's made the game a little bit too similar to professional sports uh, in a certain aspect, which I don't like because I do like that, that magic of, of college football. 
Um, and it, it seems like, you know, one of the things I predicted is it might cause some problems in the locker room, you know, where you have some people getting paid more than, than others and some maybe not seeing much at all. And I don't know if I mentioned back then, but potential transfer issues, you know, you could have a, a, a three-year quarterback at one school, uh, then a quarterback at another school in a bigger market leads for the NFL, this guy who would have stayed normally to be a four-year starter. Now, Mike, you know, transfer after three seasons to get that paycheck. And it's really too early to see how much of that is going to play out, but we're seeing some of it. So, you know, I hope something can be done. I don't, I don't know what the answer is, uh, but it'd be, it'd be neat if we could mitigate that in college football to keep that magic there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, overall, I'm not going to be one of those people that's, you know, staunch in my ways and say, no, these players shouldn't get paid at all because the wrong people were getting paid. And, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's really a happy thought to think these kids um, are setting themselves up for financial success later in life. Uh, so my interpretation of the magic of the game isn't as important as the well-being of the kids uh, that are out there putting their, their blood, sweat, and tears uh, into playing. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Obviously, our episode is not going to be just about this, but I appreciate your insight as a former collegiate athlete. Um, my dad covers sports around here for a local TV station, so he's friends with all the coaches, and he was speaking to uh, the BYU head coach, Kalani Sataki, uh, not too long ago, and Kalani was telling him, like, the first thing that, that – that is asked when he's recruiting and sits down on the couch with the family, the very first thing the recruits ask are how much money can I make? So you're right. It's just different. Like it's a different kind of quite like, could you imagine asking that like outside of like a scholarship? Like you would have never even thought to ask like how much money I can make for college, but right. It's just, it's changing kind of landscape and yeah, very interesting to see play out. It is interesting. And uh, you know, if any players happen to watch this, go ahead and keep asking uh, that question because if money, money's in it for you, um, it's, it's not your job to change the rules. It's, it's your job to do the best for yourself. So, you know, I fully, fully support the athletes trying to, to do what's best uh, for them. Hate the game. Don't hate the player. I would do exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly the same thing. So, again, I really appreciate that. Um, cool. Well, we've got a lot of really great things to talk about. You've done a lot in the last few years. Uh, since we first talked, um, it has been a while, so I'd love for you to go into your story. We're going to talk about strength training and nutrition, get some supplementation in there. But um, for the listener who hasn't heard you speak before, can you tell them um, how you got interested in, in health and fitness to begin with, how you transitioned from your football career to your professional career, and how you leverage different things in health and fitness to make yourself um, in, in better shape? Yeah, so you know, I grew up uh, as an athlete, normally three sports basketball, football, baseball, you know, there's some soccer in there. I uh, got a black belt in Kempo karate uh, did all kinds of things. And so always really had that interest in uh, fitness, but when you're younger, uh, nutrition doesn't really become a part of it. It's something I think people don't really understand you, what your, your parents give you. Um, you know, my parents did feed me relatively well, but it wasn't really something that, you know, came to mind how to optimize or eat healthier uh, or for certain goals. Uh, so fast forward on into college, you know, the, the football teams, the uh, athletic teams that, and um, NCAA, they often have nutritionists and you start learning uh, a little bit more and getting more into that. Um, and so as I started, you know, lifting more for, for football and eating more for football, I started getting more and more into how I could become a better player and incorporate uh, lifting and nutrition uh, to, to maximize my, my potential. And I started going into the rabbit holes online on like the different bodybuilding forums and whatnot. And that's how I stumbled across the ketogenic diet. I think it might've been on like bodybuilding.com or anabolicminds.com. I can't remember. I had read about it. I'm reading, you know, high fat, low carb, uh, steak, eggs, cheese, butter, you know, avocado, or, you know, maybe go out to the in and out and just ditch the, uh, the, the buns and, and have a, a protein style, a low carb keto burger. And I was like, this actually sounds really cool, but I don't think I could implement it as a defensive lineman trying to get over 300 pounds. Weight loss is the goal, but I'm going to keep this in the back of my mind for when I'm done playing because I know I can't be walking around 290 plus pounds and uh, be as healthy as I want to be. So fast forward to after my playing days and I continued on lifting and going back you know, to your introduction uh, three days a week, uh, at first... I, when, you know, I'm cut loose into the real world, okay, how do I lift? And I have all this knowledge from football. So I'm, I'm in there lifting a couple hours, you know, four five, six days a week, uh, trying to implement this ketogenic diet. And I realize with responsibilities, 
uh, in, in life, you know, professionals, relationships, uh, wanting to start a family later on. I can't be living in the, the gym like I'm a football player. So I you know, cut it down to three days a week, utilizing full body, using some of my research that I had put together to be able to stimulate my muscles enough to grow uh, without spending a crap load of time in the gym. And then nutrition, you know, I decided I'm going to go ahead and implement that ketogenic diet. And I knew from everything I read that it was going to be tough at first and uh, that I might want to give up. But from all the, the stories I had read and all the research I read, when you break on through the other side, I think you made a nice analogy uh, a few years ago about waiting in, in line to get in an air, air, airplane. You know, you're in a bad location. It's hot, it's muggy, but you know, there's the other side. There's a reward that awaits you. So I, I went through that uh, keto flu and not feeling um, as energetic as I would like. And I did break on through the other side. So now all of a sudden I'm lifting three days a week and uh, my, my strength is amazing. My, my physique is maintaining and, and, you know, putting a little emphasis on maybe some of the pretty muscles that I didn't so much do in football uh, since I didn't need to lift a certain way to be on the field anymore. So I cut down that time in the gym. And then I started losing weight super fast going on into uh, keto, uh, which I ended up losing 92 pounds over the course of 12 months. Uh, so that was really cool. You know, I had a lot of free time from lifting three days a week and I had to get a whole bunch of new clothes after losing 92 pounds. <laughs> Good problem to have. That's great. <laughs> Wait, you, so, so you mentioned that time, the transition time, and you and I have talked, and I did five weeks, I think you were feeling pretty terrible. Um, mm -hmm. knowing, knowing what you know now, what would you have done differently to help ease that transition? So I think, um, you know, no matter what you do to prepare going keto, since you're making a, a change that your body's not used to, you're going to go through something. Uh, I think maybe what I would have done differently is schedule electrolyte intake throughout the day. Uh, I, I was doing a pretty good job getting my electrolytes in, but it was more like, all right, I'm just going to make sure I get them in where I think if I spread them out better throughout the day, uh, it, it would have, um, you know, worked a, a little bit better, kept me more even keel. And then another thing uh, which could have been beneficial, and I'm, I'm not sure how to, to validate this, but I would imagine, you know, back then, that my sleeping habits weren't what they should have been because I was probably busy trying to have uh, fun with my uh, girlfriend and my wife going out on the town and whatnot. And um, maybe I wouldn't have done that differently. Maybe it was worth it to, to, to feel a little suboptimal to have fun with my, my friends and uh, future family. But looking at it from just a feeling good aspect or you know, maybe somebody who is a bit more mature than I was back then trying to get into keto now, uh, prioritize electrolytes, uh, prioritize sleep. Yeah. Okay. That's really helpful. I think we've got a lot of people out there who are really anxious to get going on their new year's goals and resolutions and, you know, January's world carnivore month. So people are trying that. And, um, I think having those tips and tricks might help them along the way, which is great. Um, you stole the travel yeah. analogy from me, which I stole from somebody <laughs> else. Um, but, but it was a mutual exchange because you stole that from me, but I stole something from you that I really liked on our last episode. And we were talking about mindset and how, again, like, like, it, is it a willpower thing? And you said, you said that you wanted to understand and you had this attitude for yourself that don't trade, I'm paraphrasing, don't trade what you want for what you want right now. Is that, did I say that correctly? Yeah. Don't trade what you want the most for what you want at the moment. So, you know, easy keto example, you're in the, the grocery store checkout line and you see that candy bar, that's your favorite candy bar. You really want it in the moment, but you know, long-term you want to lose that weight and you're trying to implement a ketogenic diet. Don't trade that, uh, that want that you have the most for weight loss for that want in the moment for that candy bar, which, uh, you know, is going to be out of your way once you're in the car or on the walk home. Yeah, we see that all the time. In fact, somebody just posted a really um, quite emotional video on Twitter. Maybe you saw it. I, we invited him to be on the show to kind of talk about it. But it was a, about a four minute long video of him in the parking lot of a grocery store and him saying, like, I'm on this weight loss journey. I've lost however much pounds he's lost. He looks really good. I've still got a ways to go. And he's sitting in the parking lot and almost in tears. And he's like, I, 
I, I know I can't go in this grocery store. If I go in this grocery store, the bakery is right up front. I will buy the cookies. If I buy the cookies, I'm going to eat the cookies. If I eat the cookies, I'm going to feel terrible. I'm going to feel bad about myself. My joints are going to hurt. And I'm going to set myself back on this weight loss goal. And again, for four minutes, just kind of talking himself through. And eventually he drove away, which is great. But, um, you know, the food addiction thing can be really real for a lot of people out there. Is that something that you see with a lot of the clients that you have? Oh, oh yeah, of course. I think it's a you know it's a hard thing to break, and I think you're referring to Eric Couch. So um, yeah, that's exactly right. Eric, Thank you. Yeah, Eric, if if you watch this, uh, it's been fun watching your your progress online. I'm super proud of you, dude. I think you're an inspiration to many. So keep it up, Eric. But um, yeah, food addiction is real, and I mean that goes in in many directions as well. We all eat every day, and uh, you know something. It's it's a basic need. Or you die. <laughs> uh, sorry to state the obvious, but you know you have food addiction. Most of the time, you think about it in terms of eating something like cookies or uh, chocolate or ice cream or whatnot. But it, it goes beyond that. I think you know you can even look the other way in the, into orthorexia with people who are obsessed with you know healthy eating. Um, you know, they might get a, addicted to their certain subset of foods as well. Uh, you know, some of that might be, or a lot of that might be mental, where they're actually, you know, in this in this journey of optimization, and they've kind of been misled because, um, you know, they're they're so hyper focused on so, something where the data might not s support it, or they've gotten so. I'm looking for the right light, uh, the right word here. Um, I don't know, ze zealotry sometimes, but not, not all the times. But yeah, I think you see food addiction in all, all different, you know, forms, e even in healthy eating. Um, but yeah, it is, it is a real, uh, a real problem. And, you know, it's great when people take a, um, take a step back and they're honest with themselves and uh, try and do something good about it. That's a really great point. And thank you for remembering his name, Eric, a great guy. Again, we were exchanging a few messages um, and, and yeah, it was a really powerful video. Orthorexia, I think is a, is a great word to drop there, which is like the fear of a certain type of food. And it's something that, like you said, being really self-critical, I have to look at myself all the time doing carnivore diet and say like, am I, am I pushing this too far? Am I being a little bit too extreme? And it's, you're right. It's something to examine. I, I, you know, I tend to feel really good when I eat those things, but you're right. Like you can cause serious orthorexic issues with people that they're like completely terrified to eat certain things, even though those things are not going to harm them. It's a fine line between that versus the sugar addiction, where if somebody has a little, they'll then have a lot. And so knowing yourself, like you said, I think is a really important point. Yeah. A hundred percent. Okay. Awesome. So you use, a ketogenic diet to be able to drop your weight all the way down. I believe you got very, very close to 200 pounds. Um, but you, you also found that that weight was a little bit low for you and you were able to stay low carbohydrate for the most part from what I understand, but also be able to gain weight. So, um, we're going to have listeners out there that want to understand how to use a low carbohydrate diet to lose a bunch of weight, but we're also going to have listeners who want to gain weight. They want to build muscle. So what did those two kind of diets look like to you? Generally speaking. Yeah. So to this, to show where I was at, where I went to, and then where I got to, I was 293 pounds. Uh, I lost 92 pounds all the way to 201. And I was just like, I cannot get in the 100s. Uh, that would be way too thin for me. It looked great, but, um, you know, I was starting to feel it. And I was starting to feel like I looked like a, a walking uh, clothes hanger. And so I knew I had to put some, some weight back on. Now, uh, I do want to say for full transparency, I did have an advantage uh, the fact that I had built up so much muscle as a defensive lineman weighing 293 pounds, I had already, you know, whatever the scientific term for, for it is, I had already grown those muscle cells and had those, you know, that established framework in place. So when I had gotten to where I was too thin, um, I was at a point where it'd be quicker to build that strength back up. So I realized, okay, obviously I'm going to have to eat more if I want to put on more muscle or more weight. But, you know, it's not it's not really about weight, even though weight's part of the equation. It, it's about muscle mass. I want it to be a little bit uh, thicker, a little bit stronger, but I was getting too weak. So I just simply increased the amount of calories I was eating, uh, although I did it ketogenically. So when I got, you know, really lean, carbs are already low, right? So the next thing that you got to start cutting out is, is, is fat. You don't want to really cut out protein. So I just kept on a ketogenic diet and started adding more and more fat to it uh, to help get those calories in. Of course, a little bit of fat came on, um, but I was able to go ahead uh, with more calories to 
to, to gain some of that muscle back. And I mean, protein did increase too, uh, even though, you know, normally I was still eating that, that one gram of uh, protein per pound of uh, body mass, or at that point, I might've been lean body mass, trying to get my calories as low as possible. But yeah, I kept carbs low, fat went up, some protein went up. And uh, over a period of time, I forget how long that, that, uh, that muscle mass, a lot of it came back on. Um, so ever since my football career has ended, I've been in the range pretty much of like 210 to 240. So I think in like 2021 and 2022, even the, you know, first quarter, or first half of 2023, I, I stuck around in maybe the 230 to 240 range most of the time. Uh, and then the, the back half of last year and so far this year, I've been in like the 215 to 220. 25 range uh, and um, maintaining that that weight pretty good uh, but each and every year I'm able to get uh, leaner at the same body weight so I, I know that uh, you know things are, are progressing nicely yeah that's awesome okay this was on a recent blog of yours which I really love how you approach this you talked about the different types of ketogenic diets I believe one was medical one was fitness one was fad and it's important to consider here because we're talking about ketogenic diets and you're talking about protein and protein recommendations. And somebody might hear this and think like, okay, he's talking about the ketogenic diet, but I thought the ketogenic diet was restricted in protein. I thought it was like 20, maybe 25% of your calories from protein. And what you're talking about must be north of that. So how do you help people determine which level of doing a ketogenic diet is right for them and which ones have become a fad, like you say? Yeah, so I'm not a medical professional. So if somebody needs to come to me for medical advice, uh, which a lot of people do, uh, surprisingly, I tell them that um, they shouldn't work with me. They should consult with somebody that's a professional in the field because I want the, the best for their health. So to get medical keto out of the way, yeah, that was you know developed early in 1900s, I believe, uh, for or mainly for epilepsy patients, and that's the the moderate to lower uh, protein type of keto where you're having you know 80, 90 percent fat. So a lot of times, especially online, you see uh, you know the actually people actually you're not keto because keto is, and it's like okay, dude, ma'am, whatever. That's that's medical keto, and you know exactly what I'm referring to about keto, which is the more mainstream, which I call you know fitness keto. And what that is, is ketosis by removal of carbohydrates because you have certain fitness goals, whether, you know, you're a weightlifter wanting to lose body fat, whether you're, you know, a stay at home mom, you don't exercise that much, but you just want to get leaner throughout nutrition. Um, so, you know, it's a health and fitness style of keto where you get into ketosis and lose fat by way of, of removing the carbohydrates and not worrying about being 80 to 90% fat because you don't need to have that super high ketone level uh, because you're not epileptic. And then there's fad keto. And what that is, is, you know, again, going back to the grocery store checkout line, you see uh, this colorful magazine that says keto and, you know, telling you all this cool keto stuff. And it's really just advertisement for like keto gummy bears or take these exogenous ketones to, you know, get you into ketosis. It's like, Keto is about removing something, not about adding something. So fad keto is where they're trying to sell you different keto products and treats, and they've really commercialized keto. Uh, so yeah, when I speak to keto, I'm speaking about fitness-oriented keto where ketosis is achieved via the removal of carbs. Okay, perfect. That's the way I think about it as well. And I realize everybody's got a different way that they think about it. And you're right. Like in the last few years, as keto's gotten more and more popular, we get more and more products they're just, it's crap. It's just a whole bunch of crap that you're right. People are, are benefiting from and making money on people from. So it, it's a shame. Um, tell us a little bit about the, the type of protein that you encourage most people to go towards, because we've heard in the last few years that plant proteins might be just as effective in certain situations as animal proteins. I don't necessarily think the data on that is, is very good, frankly, but what, what do you think as far as like your, your source of protein? Animal source protein is, is uh, superior to plant-based protein. And, you know, all the data that is shown that plant-based protein is uh, the same or just better is funded by people with, you know, interests in, in having that. But if you look at a, a neutral study, you know, composed by somebody uh, or an organization who's just trying to figure it out scientifically, everything always points to plant-based. I mean, sorry, animal-based protein is uh, superior. Plant-based protein is uh, in inferior. So, 
I think, you know, animal uh, based protein, or I, I know is uh, what's what's optimal. Uh, that said, I don't want to hate on plant based protein. You know, I understand that people choose the way that they eat for uh, certain reasons. And, you know, that's personal, that's to you. So if, uh, you know, you're a plant based individual, you're feeling good, and you're healthy, continue on who is who's somebody else to tell you how to eat. And, you know, a lot of people aren't trying to be the biggest strongest, you know, most chiseled person, they just want to be healthy and you can be perfectly, you know, healthy on a, a plant-based diet if you do it right and you're getting your right macro and micronutrients. Uh, but as far as the protein itself, I mean, animal protein is, is complete and it's amino acid profile and it's more bioavailable and your body is going to assimilate it a lot better than it will with plant-based uh, proteins, which you often have to supplement uh, in addition to in in order to be properly nourished. So it's, you know, it's just superior and humans uh, evolved that way. Um, and I think, I think the debate about it is, is silly. Um, and, you know, I think there are a lot of people who are plant-based and rational who, who do realize that, you know, animal protein is uh, superior when you're speaking to uh, muscle growth or bioavailability, but they understand that they, they can be healthy as well in their way. And they don't, you know, they're, they're not stepping on, on stage to be a professional bodybuilder or something. So they can, they can do just fine. Um, but yeah, that, that's my opinion. Animal based is the, uh, I don't want to say opinion. It's a fact that animal base is uh, superior. I, I agree with you. I think that's absolutely right. And then one more time, generally speaking, for somebody that wants to improve their fitness, we're talking about fitness keto, the kind that you primarily coach to, what are you looking for as far as recommendations for the amount of intake of protein in a day? So, you know, you get a standard rule of one gram of protein per pound of body weight. And that's a pretty good rule for a large group of people. And where that uh, was derived from is that if you eat that much, you are going to be meeting all of your protein needs. So it's something that you can go on ahead and do. But why I say for most people and not all is because once you're, you know, 200, 220 pounds and, and above, that can become a lot of protein to eat. And realistically, you actually only need about a pound per pound of lean body mass um, to be in, in good shape to, to grow muscle. But it's a lot harder to calculate what your lean body mass is. So if you just go with one pound per, uh, or one gram per pound of body weight, you know you're going to be purposely overshooting what you need and it's gonna ensure that uh, you're, you're getting uh, your protein requirement. Uh, so, you know, if you're, if you're super into fitness or, and have a good idea of what your, your body fat percentage is, you can go ahead and do the calculation and do that one gram uh, per pound of lean body mass. Uh, but yeah, I, I say, you know, if you're under 200 pounds, just go ahead and shoot for that, that one gram for, for most people. And if you're over, uh, maybe do a little bit of uh, estimates on how much you need. You know, you can go online, uh, look at some pictures. I, I send to my clients who want to know their body fat percentage, but maybe they can't get it tested and whatnot because they want to be more precise. I have this diagram showing different people at different body fat levels and say, all right, let's figure out which one you are on this scale. Somebody, let's say 17%. Okay. That means you're 83% uh, lean body mass. Let's, you know, multiply 0.83 by your body weight. Bam. Now we have the amount of protein that you need to be hitting if we're going on that uh, per uh, pound of lean body mass standard. Yeah, I really like that. I was just going to say, if you did have access to a body fat scale, most of them tell you the percentage of body fat, but don't tell you the lean body mass. Lean body mass obviously is everything that's not fat. So if you have the, the percentage, multiply the percentage, the way you did it, the point, whatever the number is by the total pounds that will give you the, your absolute number of fat. And, and if you subtract your total weight, your, I'm sorry, if you subtract the total fat from your total body weight, everything that's remaining would be your lean body mass. And so that might give you that nice target. I'll sometimes say, like, think about what your ideal weight would be, like what you would like it to be, and try to get to that target. It certainly isn't to say, like, if you're 400 pounds, you need to be eating 400 grams of protein a day, like you said. All of those, I think, are very reasonable. And if you think about those recommendations for the average person, you know, maybe female, 130, 140, 150 pounds, or male or around your weight, that's like, Dude, that's like three or four times higher than the RDA that we see that you need to get. Like people are saying like 50 to 60 grams of protein from like almonds and peas or pea protein. Like it's ridiculous, the recommendations out there. Yeah, a lot of recommendations out there, you know, I don't even like to call them recommendations because they're, they're, they're so crazy. But um, yeah, it's something that, you know, 
when you're into fitness and nutrition, you think, man, this is simple stuff. But then when you talk to people who don't have the same interest to you, you realize that this is new territory for, for a lot of people. And, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, I hope to uh, use my platforms to educate people on uh, where, you know, they can learn a thing or two uh, that's actually, you know, simple to, to people in fitness and nutrition and uh, will one day uh, become simple to them, hopefully. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, you mentioned zealotry before. I don't know how you managed to like be part of every camp without actually being officially in the camp. Like you'll do like almost no fat days. You'll do really high fat days. Some days there's green stuff on your plate. I see all the carnivores <laughs> freaking out myself. Um, so, so I love, I love how you do that. And you're very non-dogmatic, which I, I really love and appreciate. Um, I want to talk to you about incorporating carbohydrates. Some people are carnivore like myself, kind of more long-term, it's kidding up to five years for me. I feel no desire to bring any bit of them in. And in fact, when I try something, it generally reactivates my food addiction and carb addiction. And I just, I get cravings and I don't like them for the next day and a half. I'm just like Taco Bell sounds good. You know what I mean? Like gross stuff that wouldn't normally sound good. And those cravings reactivate. So for me, it's easier to stay away from them. Other people find that they can do carnivore for a time or very low carbohydrate, keto, whatever you like. And then they can start to reintegrate things. So that's certainly something you played with a lot. How, what would be recommendations that you would make for somebody that maybe has been very strict with their diet, but they also want to start to kind of open things up a little bit. What kinds of foods do you recommend that they play with if they want to start to try to mix in more carbohydrates? So, you know, speaking to keto and carnivore uh, and carnivore, carnivore more so there, they are forms of elimination diets. So you're, you're taking so much out of, you know, so much junk out of what you normally eat. And then that way you kind of build a base of uh, of health and you can start adding things back from there and see what you can deal with well and see what you can deal with not so well so you know whatever diet you do heck i mean even even some types of plant-based diets if you're actually eating everything you know all natural and um you know nothing that's too processed or ultra processed um you, you can you know start adding different products back at most diets are forms of uh, elimination diets uh, at their, at their core uh, when they're based on whole natural foods. So then when you are going to incorporate other foods back into it, so let's take me, for example, uh, doing strict, strict keto, uh, doing some carnivore here and there. Uh, when I'm adding foods back, my focus is on full natural foods. So like you'll hear people who were strict keto for a while and they say, oh, I tried to reincorporate carbs and I felt absolutely horrible. And then you see that the way they incorporated carbs is they went out and binged on pizza and ice cream. So it's like, okay, you reincorporated carbs, but you reincorporated a ton of junk. Whereas when I'm having a, a higher carb day, because I, I like to run keto uh, cyclically and, and utilize carbs to my advantage, my focus is on, you know, clean natural carbs, things like um, potatoes. I like to eat, you know, sushi, uh, pineapples. I, I love date fruits. Um, maybe instead of having kefir, I'll go ahead and have, have raw milk, which ha has a higher amount of carbohydrates. Uh, so I'm, I'm focusing on real natural foods when I incorporate those carbs back in. Uh, I, and at this point in my life, I don't like people ask me, oh, do you just feel, you know, one day you just want to like rip into a bag of Doritos and have a Snickers bar. Uh, there was a time years and years ago when I first started where I, I did. But nowadays, like you put one of those in front of me and it's, you know, it's unappetizing and, and I don't want it. So, yeah, when I reincorporate foods that are higher in carbohydrates, they're, they're healthy, natural foods. Okay. Um, yeah. And you're right with the processed foods. It's amazing how over time they just, they could be paint chips. Like they, they don't appeal to you anymore. You don't really see them as food or crave them nearly as much. Um, is there any aspect of timing with your carbohydrates in a given day when you are including them? Um, is there, is there what, what's your thought process between uh, around like timing of carbohydrates? A lot of times, yes, but a hundred percent of the time, no. I mean, like if I'm on vacation or you know, I'm uh, at a family member's birthday party. It's like, whatever. But in most cases, yes, I am timing up my carbohydrates. So as I had mentioned, I like to run the cyclical ketogenic diet where I'm carving up every couple of, of weeks, which um, helps me on a, you know, a, a lot of different areas. And when I'm timing those carbohydrates, it's, it's normally going to begin the night before a lift. I like to do it before, um, 
before leg day because uh, you know I think that's the best day to, to utilize those those carbs to have that explosiveness on the way up out of a deep squat. And my my carb ups will last like one to three days uh, for the most part. So uh, I'll I'll do that that carb up the night before leg day, and then that leg day I'll continue on doing my carb up. And if I have a third day in there. Um, start winding it down uh, that day afterwards. But yeah, I do tend to time them uh, around my lifting sessions. Do you notice a difference with your sleep? No, I, uh, I, I sleep pretty, pretty much the same. And I actually get asked that question a lot. So um, I, I don't know, maybe it's something just personal to me because other people have said they've had disturbances, but I think I've built up some decent metabolic flexibility. So as long as my carb sources are healthy, um, it doesn't affect me. Yeah, that's awesome. I intuitively, I would think that carbs at night wouldn't be the best idea. There's tons of people out there that say it absolutely is the best idea. It helps with sleep and makes sleep better for you, maybe a little bit indifferent. So I, yeah, interesting to hear your opinion on that. I, I it's I, yeah, I'm nice to get everybody's opinion about it. Maybe it's weird for me. I just, I, I feel like, you know, Eating at night just helps me sleep in general. Um, did I did I freeze on your end here? I'm looking frozen on my phone. The video froze. Uh, audio is great. All right. Um, let me know if the audio cuts out. We'll see if this video comes back. But um, yeah, I, I feel you know whether it's a high carb meal or a high fat meal, uh, I sleep well at night. I have noticed if I really do want to get to bed early and I'm not worried about having a ton of calories. I'll have a super high fat meal and that'll knock me out pretty good. And I'm not afraid to eat right before I go to sleep. Some people talk about how bad it is for you. Um, it hasn't caused anything negative for me. So I go ahead and, and I do that when I want to. Excellent. I appreciate that opinion. Um, if, if uh, It doesn't really matter to me, um, but if you do, do you want the video? Like, do you want to, Oh, there we go. I was just going to say, if you want to reset it, it. Yeah, we're back. Yeah, so that's a, that's a, that's what I I just did there. All right, cool, perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll just make an edit there. That'd be easy. Okay, so talking about nutrition now, I'm curious to talk to you about supplementation. I'm generally not a huge supplementation guy. I got paid to sell supplements for a long time, so I have a bit of an aversion to that industry. However, I do think that supplements play a key role, and you and I both have a supplement that we really really love, which is creatine. Can you can you talk a little bit about what creatine is and why you are so in love with it? Yeah, so talk on supplementation. You know, I went a couple of years where I wasn't, you know, really taking anything except for creatine. And then I started having some uh, magnesium here and there. And when I speak of supplements, just kind of like speaking to diet, medical keto versus fitness keto versus fad keto, there's kind of some, some parallels with supplements supplements. Like I'm not into things like test booster 6900 or, you know, whatever all this crazy stuff is. When I'm looking at supplements, I'm looking at something that actually, you know, supplements my, my food intake, something that is uh, already in the food, but, you know, maybe in, in higher quantities. And some of that could be because uh, as we've seen, for example, uh, with ma magnesium, that a lot of foods that were once higher in magnesium are now, um, are, or now insufficient in it just because of how agriculture and, and the world has evolved. Um, but yeah, to go to go back to creatine, you know, that is something where you can get good amounts of it in eating uh, red meat. And a lot of people will say, oh, you don't need to supplement creatine on top of red meat. And if you know anything about me is that uh, I ate a ton of red meat. You know, I, I, I did that Texas Steakhouse Challenge, the big, the big Texan ate four and a half pounds there in uh, about 18 minutes. And I, I, I still I still take creatine. And I notice a significant uh, difference when I take it and when I don't. And the reason being, even though you're getting creatine through uh, meat, um, some of it's degraded when you cook it and it takes longer to assimilate into the muscles rather than if you're to just supplement it. So I like to combine natural healthy habits with you know, modern science and technology to go above and beyond uh, what the body can do with creatine, just getting it from natural sources. So when you supplement creatine, that's keeping your creatine stores uh, in, your, in your muscles saturated throughout the day to a level that they're not gonna be saturated if you were just going to be eating uh, a lot of meat. So that, that, that amount of creatine in your muscles there, that's helping with uh, recovery. 
that is helping you with performance in the gym, which is why on lift days, I like to take my creatine, you know, about 30, 45 minutes before I, I get in the gym and just keeping your, your creatine levels elevated throughout the day, rather than uh, depleting throughout the day in the same manner they would if you were to get it just through food. So I've gone times where I haven't taken creatine at all. I've gone times where I've just taken creatine on lift days. I've had times where, you know, I just, sporadically forgot I had creatine, so I took it all over the place. And then I've had times where I, you know, took it very, very consistently where I'm taking it every single day, making sure that no matter what, I'm getting it in. And when I've been 100% consistent like that, my recovery has been better. My performance in the weight room has uh, been better, you know. I. If I can eke out that extra rep, I can, you know, get more weight on the bar faster than I could beforehand. So the, the, there's a huge benefit there. And, you know, it's not just me saying this. You can talk to a, a lot of people that eat a ton of meat who have noticed that positive difference when they incorporate it. So it's something that I'm really a fan of. And seeing all the research that's been done over the years that's, you know, almost 100% positive, I feel very comfortable, you know, saying that it's something that most people would, would benefit from taking. And I mean, to touch on some of the negatives and how ridiculous they are um, about it is um, like, you see that hair loss study. I think, uh, I think I'm good on, on, on hair, I, you <laughs> know, so I, I wouldn't worry about that. That, that one study uh, was uh, none of the participants even suffered from any hair loss. It was something to do with DHT levels. They were bad controls. They found out the people whose DHT levels rose had low, lower than average DHT levels to begin with. And it was probably just the working out that raised them to normal rates, which doesn't uh, affect hair loss anyways. And then if, if uh, you know, creatine did create hair loss through DHT levels, it would affect women more than men because they would be more sensitive to that kind of hormonal change. And we don't see women reporting hair loss from creatine, only men. And the reason it's men is because men are more prone to male pattern baldness. So whether they took the creatine or not, they're going to be losing the hair. And then another thing that, you know, has um, caused all these uh, unfortunate myths of creatine uh, to get out into the open is that creatine be became popular in the early 90s, which was also the same time that uh, steroids became very prominent in uh, the NFL and in the MLB. So, you know, when all these guys uh, were getting extremely huge or getting some kind of injury or something was happening, what were they going to point their finger at? The stuff they were taking that was not supposed to be taken? No, they were pointing their finger at, at the creatine and then all these, these myths popped up. So a lot of the negativity, all that negativity is, uh, is false and, um, you know, don't, don't believe me. I'm just an, an internet stranger. I encourage everybody to go do their, their, their research on, on their own. And if they're not comfortable, don't take it. But um, I think a lot of people, once they do their own research and then they, they start taking a little bit, become very comfortable and it becomes uh, a part of their routine. Yeah, I love that. You mentioned the research and it is quite amazing how much research has been done on creatine by far the most tested supplement out there. And I haven't seen much of the way of negative. I appreciate that you went to, you know, all the positive things you noticed, all the negative things you notice or, or people talk about. And that's not really founded by science, which I, I again, I appreciate. Um, it, it's cool. The research is also showing really positive effects on mental health as well. I'm not sure if you've come across that work um, as well, but that's pretty promising. Yeah, I started to read a little bit into the cognitive benefits. I probably need to do more of that. Um, you know, the reason I haven't is because I don't take it for the cognitive benefits. I take it for the physical benefits as, as a weightlifter. But seeing th this new door opening on uh, research on cognitive benefits of creatine, how it, you know, improves brain function and uh, enhances memory, I'm like, okay, this is this is pretty cool, just an, you know, an added bonus. And I think it also shows how the, the body and mind uh, work so closely together. So yeah, another, uh, another point for, for, for creatine. And I'm excited to start learning more as more data comes out. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So when I ask somebody about creatine or suggest it to, to add to their, um, you know, what they're doing for nutrition, a lot of pushback I get is people hear that it, you retain a lot more water. So it gives the muscles the appearance of being bigger, but they're not actually bigger. And for that reason, I get a ton of pushback from women who I'm suggesting to take creatine as well. What do you say to that? It's not just women, it's men too. I mean, when somebody's goal is to lose weight and a lot of people are trying to cut, even when they should be bulking, 
they don't want to see the scale go up. And I understand that it's, it's very psychological, but creatine, it pulls that, that water on into your muscles. So that's the weight gain that you're seeing. So if you're going to start taking creatine, but you have weight loss on your mind, I would give yourself about a five pound buffer, knowing that that's the intramuscular water that you're holding onto. But that's a good thing because it's showing that your, your muscles are saturated with the creatine, which is providing all those, those physical benefits, which are enhancing recovery, which are, you know, increasing performance, which is generating more ATP to use uh, inside of your muscles as energy uh, for when you're in the weight room or when you're out performing an athletic activity. So when you're, you're losing weight, remember that you want to look in the mirror, not the scale. Uh, regarding the bloat as well, when people say, oh, I get bloated on creatine, uh, if you ask a lot of people what they're taking, they're not just taking pure creatine. It's some kind of weird proprietary mix. So it's probably not the creatine that's causing that bloat. And then, you know, some people, yeah, they, 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 they will experience a little bit of bloat there, but that's a very, very small amount of people. And normally it tends to work its, itself away anyways. And, and you flush that and only hold that water intramuscularly. Now I have heard the biggest, people, sorry, the, the biggest group of people that will experience bloat is people who do creatine loading, which you don't need to do. And that's just because you're taking such a massive amount in just uh, a, a short amount of time. And to speak on loading, uh, why some people say you need to do it, why you don't need to do it. Um, if you load up, your, your muscles are going to saturate sooner. So even though it's not necessary, there is a benefit to it. But if you just take it consistently, I think at about, you know, three and a half, four weeks is when your muscles hit that full saturation point. And, uh, you know, three and a half, four weeks is nothing in the grand scheme of things. So if you're worried about bloat, just don't, don't load up on it. Take a clean source, you know, from a brand you can trust, research the brand, make sure that it's tested by third party labs. So you're getting, uh, the purest, cleanest creatine you can. And, um, be, be cognizant of what you look like in the mirror as well. It could just be mental where now you're paying more attention to yourself and your abs aren't as chiseled as you want them to be or something. So make, make sure you get a before picture. And so that way you can actually have visual evidence of whether you've bloated or not. Yeah, those are really good tips. And I know on your website, you have written articles about this and what to look for. So I'm assuming we really want to look for creatine, monohydrate or creapure. Is that true? Yeah, so um, Creapure is a form of creatine monohydrate, but you don't actually buy it from a brand called Creapure. It's a, a company that's based in Germany that their production line of creatine is, you know, all in-house and it is pass it passes all these different certifications. It's tested by third-party labs and it's been proven to be the purest, cleanest form of creatine you can get. It comes at a small price premium, which um, a lot of people are, are willing to pay. But if you know you want to save a couple of dollars, you can just find uh, you know plenty of other brands out there that um, that are tested by third party labs, and it it'll be you know just as good um, for the most part. Uh, just that Korea period gives you that peace of mind. And then I, I think uh, I, I forgot to touch on this point where I said Creapure isn't its own brand. Uh, they they manufacture the creatine and then they allow other brands to uh, license and use it. So you'll see all these different big name brands out there that sell creatine and advertise, oh, this is Creapure uh, because they're approved to use the the Creapure from the company that's on over in, uh, in Germany. So it's a pretty cool business model that they have going on. And um, yeah, it's available in a, in a lot of stores, a lot of places online. And yeah, for me, it just gives that that great peace of mind that I, I know I have this clean, pure uh, creatine and that I know that it's you know untainted. Yeah, I love that. And again, if somebody has questions, they can just go to your website and find the brand that you like there. Um, it's it's really cool, by the way. I just have to say, like all the list of things you post there, including our favorite pan. You and I cook a tremendous amount of fried eggs. <laughs> and so having fried eggs not stick um, is really important. So we have the fry pan that you have in there, which is awesome, which we both have, the hex clad, which is amazing, um, and all kinds of stuff there. I'm really surprised you actually don't have hot sauce. You're wearing the El Yucateco uh, hot sauce. I told you um, when I saw it, I, I decided <laughs> to go out and buy it. And dude, that that stuff is spicy, man. This stuff is really hot. <laughs> oh yeah. I love, I love it. But you know, I grew up in San Diego, California. So uh, right, right near the, the border there. So we have plenty of great hot sauces and uh, yeah, I go. love spicy food. 
I'll be checking up on your website to see if the hot sauces start popping up there and see what you recommend. <laughs> you've, you've earned a lot of clout with me with all the products you've recommended over the years. Um, and then just awesome. one more thing on creatine. Um, what about um, what about protocol? So you talked a little bit about doing just, just one serving, a serving five grams every single day. If you're worried about bloating, we talk about loading. If you want to do 20 grams a day, I believe is the common recommendation for seven days. And then you back off from there. Um, timing during the day, does that matter? How do you take it? Like, like anything practical that people need to know about creatine. So what's most important is that you take that five grams uh, a day daily and that you do it consistently. That's worry number one. So don't worry about what time of the day you're taking it. Just make sure you're taking it. As far as how I do it, um, on my lifting days, I take it 30, 45 minutes pre-lift to make sure, you know, it starts uh, assimilating into my muscles for that, that extra energy for that, you know, extra rep in the gym. And then on off days, I generally, you know, take it late morning or early afternoon. I don't have a set time that I, I need to take it, but yeah, that's, that's generally how, how I do it. Uh, 30, 45 minutes before I lift or, um, you know, around midday on, on rest days. Okay. And just mix with water. I, uh, I don't say that I dry scoop it. I don't want to give anyone the wrong impression, but <laughs> I, I keep things simple, right? So I scoop it, I throw it back and then I take a sip of water or coffee, swish it around and, and throw it back. But yeah, you can, you can mix it with water. Uh, you, you can mix it in coffee. I'd recommend cold coffee if you're do doing it. You mix it with just about anything. Um, some people have complained about the, the taste, um, and so to speak on that too, most forms of creatine monohydrate are also micronized, which means they're smaller, and so they dissolve quicker, and I found that to be like tasteless, so um, yeah, you can mix it in like anything you want if you have a good clean brand. That's great. I like the down the hatch approach. It's pretty savage, dude. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> Uh, awesome. Okay. Well, we get asked about creatine all the time. So I really appreciate you going into those details. Um, hard, hard to find consistent information. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate you talking about that. We haven't left a ton of time for lifting and fitness, but we should definitely just ask you in the few years since you and I have talked, you know, you were doing a lot of the big five lifts, which are, you know, big multi-joint lifts, you think bench press, think row, think a shoulder press, a lat pull, a, a, a squat. Um, is that still the style that you are training kind of total body? You are still doing um, most of this stuff on machines, I'm assuming, in the gym. I see pictures. Um, how, what do your workouts look like these days? So, you know, my, my workouts are based around those same big five uh, compound lifts with a barbell. Uh, you know, I mix it up every now and then. Um, you know, just got some gym renovations. So we have some cool new machines that, you know, I've been incorporating. But that's on top of my base of the five big compound movements. Uh, nice gym in the neighborhood that I never uh, checked out. So while the, the new equipment was being installed, I went on over there to, and I uh, got to play with, you know, some new machines. But really, you know, they're just in addition to what I already do. For example, you know, like hack squat, pendulum squat. I do that after my squats uh, just to, to complement them and uh, work my legs as much as I could. Um, you know, been using a little bit of a plate loaded chest press after I already do my bench press. Um to work the chest a little bit more, but yeah, I'm, I'm still focused on the, the big, you know, compound movements. I think they are just incredibly uh, efficient, uh, you know, as far as stimulating your, your muscles and um, as, as far as time goes. So that'll probably be my, you know, approach for forever, I would assume. Yeah. So me too. Um, my routine doesn't change that much. I don't tend to get bored. Like there's different ways of doing the same kind of a lift. And so you can kind of mix those variables around, but I see lifting as a tool for fitness. I just, I'm going to knock it out. I'm going to do it, you know, a few days a week, kind of like you. And that, that I, that's just what I do. And, and I don't really prioritize a lot of variety for myself. I think I get in my own head when I'm thinking about the people that I'm working with my clients, thinking that they want a lot of routine. So I'm always trying to ask them like what, what they would like to do. That's a little bit different, but also thinking in, in that kind of style, how can we stick to these principles? Because these principles really, really work. How do you think about that when you're making strength training programs for people? Is it like, do you want people to have variety and do you know, a pull down in three or four different ways, or it's like, look, just, you got to do the pull down. You got to do this chest press. This is the formula and you just got to execute. So it's going to depend on the type of client I have. So for example, if I have somebody, you know, a busy corporate professional with three kids and he needs to find a way to get in the gym and minimize his time there, 
Uh, but yet still be effective. We're going to cut out as much as we can, stick to the basics, stick to the movements that are going to give him the most return on investment to get him in, get him out and get him on with his life. I do work with some younger individuals as well. They're like, heck, I like going to the gym. I want to go more than, than you like to go. I want to do this. I want to do that. And so that I'll have a conversation with them on, okay, is, do you want to you know, go to the gym this much for this long because uh, you think it's going to make you like super fit or because you enjoy being in the gym and you get fun out of trying new lifts? And so if they're the type of individual that, you know, is legitimately having fun experiencing new lifts, then we'll go ahead and, and work those on in. So it's going to be based on the client's needs once and an amount of time. Yeah. Perfect. Youth is wasted on the young dude. I used to work out like that all the time, like <laughs> hour and a half, like be there and like walk around and talk to people. And like, now it's like, no, absolutely not. Just get in, get out, get it over with, get the suffering done. <laughs> That's cool. I can't, no, I, can't I, blame I, you if you have the, have the time. I just, I just had uh, some more free time available than I had anticipated over, you know, the, the, the last couple of months of the year. So I started incorporating some uh, movements that I normally don't do trying out new machines. And that was my schedule's gotten busier. I'm like, all right, now I got to, you know, cut a lot of them out and stick to basics and the more hard, uh, the higher ROI ones are the ones that are going to going to stick around the most. Yeah, I, I agree. And it is astonishing to know what kind of results you can get in a very minimal amount of time. You really don't need tons and tons and tons of time to be able to do this. If you are that busy person who wants results, you can do this on a very minimal amount of time. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, I want to talk... <laughs> Briefly about an experience that you had uh, since we last talked where one of your posts, there was not, I didn't think that much different than anything that you posted. It absolutely exploded on the internet and you were featured on Newsweek, I believe. What was that? Like? <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, it was it was a Friday and I made steak and eggs, put some butter on the steak. Surprise, surprise. Zach's eating steak and eggs. And, uh, you know, I finished all my work for the day. I made my food, went to take a picture like I normally do to share with Twitter. And randomly, it just popped in, into my head. Uh, I think it was increase your cholesterol intake, increase your, uh, increase your testosterone. And I thought it sounded funny. And so I posted that. And oh, my goodness, it just like <laughs> blew up. It got a lot of love. It got a lot of hate. It got a lot of, you know, attention. And, you know, I'm grateful for, for all the attention because, um you know, first of all, let's, let's be real. I'm, I'm human. It, it feels nice. Uh, but second of all, I think it got a lot of uh, good exposure to people trying to improve their health, whether they like steak and eggs or not. And I think it created a lot of discussion and encouraged a lot of people to start doing their own research on uh, nutrition. And uh, so, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. And, you know, regarding Newsweek, I was in the gym and it was about 5.15 in the morning and I'm warming up. And I'm like going to uh, open or my uh, workout tracker to put my lifts in. And I see an email notification from, uh, or, or no, it wasn't even an email notification. It was, it might've been a post popped up like a reply on my, um, on my Twitter, someone saying they're from Newsweek. And I was just like, ah, another troll. And I just clicked it and was like, whoa, this guy's actually from Newsweek. And uh, yeah, he, he wrote, uh, you know, a couple of articles and uh, really cool dude, really nice guy. Some people like um, without, they must only read the headline and not the article. They're like, you know, attacking him. Oh, mainstream media trying to take the diet down. I'm like, he presented it very neutral and just, you know, he presented it at face value. So uh, yeah, he was a really cool guy, wrote some really cool pieces. And yeah, that was, that was really neat to see that um, people liked my steak and eggs enough that it got enough attention to make uh, global media. That's amazing. Well, I certainly like your steak and egg pictures as well, but um, <laughs> we only have this platform to host you on, not, not Newsweek. So yeah, what a cool experience. I often reflect on this, um, you know, as I think about kind of what me and my wife do in our company and, um, you know, we, we chose to do health and fitness, which means we'll, you know, we'll, we'll make a good amount of money. We'll never be, you know, ultra wealthy or anything, but we, we have the business that is our passion and, you know, we work six days a week, you know, get paid time off, don't have health insurance. So there's some sacrifices there. I really love your approach of like, this is not your career necessarily to go out and coach people, but you've been able to use your extra time to add value to a lot of people's lives out there with your coaching? What has it meant to you to not only just, you know, have your day job and be really good at that, but also find ways to, again, provide value for people and help them improve their lives. That must feel really good to you. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's it has provided me with so many good feelings knowing that I've been able to help people, you know, lose weight and be the thinnest they've been since high school or to put on muscle or, or break through a bench press plateau or whatever their, their goal may be. And I mean, this all just started when I was, uh, you know, bored in 2020. I just made an account just randomly tweeting pictures of steak and eggs and talking about uh, lifting. Thought it'd be fun to interact with like-minded individuals. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's been really nice to know that I've, you know, helped uh, a, a lot of people on something that I just kind of created as a, uh, you know, as a passion project, like not even a passion project, just I, I did it because I was bored. And um, yeah, it's, it, it's indescribable. Never would have imagined this, you know, that so many people would start coming to me, asking me for advice, asking me to create programs. And I mean, yeah, like you said, this isn't my full time thing. So I'm not I'm not in it for, for the money. It, yeah, it's been a nice um, benefit. But uh, it just, it just, uh, you know, fills me up with with good emotions knowing that, that I'm helping people. So, uh, you know, everyone that interacts with me online, uh, I enjoy it. And uh, I hope to keep inspiring people to live their healthiest life. I, I'm sure you will. I love that answer. Um, I love seeing all the guests on or cool on Luke pictures you get when you post all your eggs here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely love that. Uh, man, this has been an awesome conversation. Again, I really appreciate your experience and your insight. And I love that you're not too dogmatic about anything. You're just sharing what you've learned and willing to, you know, be wrong or change your mind about things over time or say, you know, I got this pretty right from the beginning. And so I, it makes me really happy that you chose to share this message and, and you are inspiring people out there. And so I think that's wonderful. Where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you and your work? Uh, best place online. I'm, I'm most active. Uh, my Twitter uh, or X Zach strength, Z A C K uh, strength. I got my website link there. Um, you know, I don't want to push any product, whatever, like I said, not for the money. Uh, just look up Zach strength. You'll find me. Uh, if you want to talk more, uh, you'll figure out how. Yeah. Awesome. And then your website as well. Is that a place where you send a lot of people? Uh, yeah, for certain information. Cause you know, I have write-ups on there, uh, recommended products and my, uh, my training programs. So like, you know, a lot of people ask me what I like. So I basically bundled it up into a website. It's helpful. I'm glad you did that. It's nice to see all those products that you recommend. And um, yeah, again, we'll link all of that in the show notes. Zach Kushner, thank you again so very much for coming back on our show. It's nice to catch up and hear that everything's gone well. Sorry about the Trojans and the losses at Utah, but <laughs> that, that will stop at least for the temporary. And hopefully we can schedule another time to play each other because those are some fun games. But anyway, thank you so very much for taking the time to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Of course. Thanks for inviting me. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, another chat at some point. Absolutely. We'll definitely catch up again. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.